Thank you, Father. We praise your Kadosh name. So, tomorrow is Shavuot, hallelujah. Pentecost, the Feast of Weeks, or the Feast of the Harvest of First Fruits, the First Fruits of the Wheat Harvest. And uh, uh, this is not going to be a 101 basic teaching on Shavuot. I've done numerous of the numerous uh, of those teachings which are all available on the internet on our website and YouTube channel and blog so we want to maybe go to some higher levels hopefully hopefully you will all be blessed I've been blessed to put this together and um, it kept expanding and expanding and expanding so now it's going to be a part one and a part two. Anyway, um, I'm going to do something a little different. And um, this week is Parasha. Um, I think it's not so. Uh, but I'm going to skip ahead. Uh, yeah, not so. And I'm going to do next week's Parasha this week. This week the, the next week's parasha, or Torah portion, starts in Numbers chapter 8. It's uh, Bahalatka. Baha, Bahalatka. There you go. There's the Hebrew. And there are two things in this wonderful Torah portion that I want to focus on that really relate to Shavuot. The menorah the lamps, the seven-branched candelabra, or the menorah that was in the tabernacle. Uh, and that's in chapter 8, Numbers chapter 8. And then we have the cloud and the fire. The glory cloud in chapter 9. Um, I'm going to read a little bit here, and uh, just kind of as a tie into this Torah portion. First of all, about the the lamp or the menorah, the seven branch menorah that went into the tabernacle of Moses. And this menorah, the lamp, which is this picture of the Torah and the spirit, it relates to the day of Pentecost. And here in a few moments, I'm going to give you a, 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 a slideshow presentation of we're going to start at the beginning of the tabernacle, and we're going to go through. And I'm going to show how it ties into the biblical feasts, the steps in the tabernacle, the plan of salvation. And we're going to especially focus on Pentecost, or Shavuot is the Hebrew name, means weeks or feast of weeks. Hog Shavuot, feast of weeks. And um, I'm going to, uh, we're going to do a little tour. A, a, an audio and a visual tour. I hope you uh, look forward to that and will enjoy that. So, and then we're going to end up in the, under the glory cloud and show how that relates to Shavuot and our own individual walk as believers and our relationship with Yeshua and our Father in Heaven and the Holy Spirit, the Ruach HaKodesh. Numbers 8, verse 1, And Jehovah spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to Aharon, and say to him, When you arrange the lamps, the seven lamps, and there were, there were seven of them. Hang on. Let me get... So this is, this is one I made many years ago. I made this out of copper. This is, this is a, a, a likeness of the seven-branched menorah that was in the tabernacle. Now, we have candles in here. But they, they would not have had candles in here. They would have had, um, actually, each of these cups here uh, would represent, uh, would actually have been filled with oil. And they would have had wicks in there, and they would have uh, filled with olive oil, which is a picture of the Holy Spirit, um, and as well as the, um, uh, the Torah. And they would have uh, had wicks in there uh, that were burning. And interestingly enough, uh, the wicks were made of the old garments, the old linen garments that the priests wore. So when their linen garments 
that they used the war when they were ministering in the tabernacle, when those linen garments wore out, then they would be ripped into strips and, and, and they become the wicks. Now, which is interesting when, you know, what this will probably a whole other discussion about these, these white linen garments represented robes of righteousness. And, um, in a sense, we are to be literally flaming torches for Yeshua <laughs> or to be on fire, our righteousness. But I'm sure one could preach a whole thing on that one. But anyway, that's what it looked like. I mean, mine was just a, um, a little rendition of it. When I get to the slideshow here in a minute, we will have a, um, we'll see a, a better looking menorah than what I made out of copper tubing and, a, and, and, um, uh, welding torches but anyway many years ago i made a whole bunch of them and uh gave them away and and so forth so speak to Aaron and say to him when you arrange the lamps the seven lamps which uh, shall give light in front of the lampstand and aaron did so he arranged the lamps to face toward the front of the lamp stand as jehovah commanded moses now this workmanship of the lampstand was hammered gold from its shaft to its flowers, it was hammered work, according to the pattern which Jehovah had shown, so he made the lampstand. Oh, we'll get into the lampstand in a little bit. We'll talk about how it was made and how it was configured. And then in chapter uh, eight, 9 of, of uh, Numbers, we read, now on the day, verse 15, uh, now on the, the day that the tabernacle was raised up, the cloud covered, this is the glory cloud, uh, covered the tabernacle and the tent of the testimony. From evening until morning, it was above the tabernacle like the appearance of fire. So it, it was always. The cloud covered it by day and the appearance of fire by night. Whenever the cloud was taken up from the above the tabernacle, after that, the children of Israel would journey. And in the place where the cloud settled, there the children of Israel would pitch their tents at the command of Jehovah, and the children, the children of Israel would journey, and at the command of Jehovah, they would camp. As long as the cloud stayed above the tabernacle, they remained encamped. Even when the cloud continued long, many days above the tabernacle, the children of Israel kept the charge of Jehovah and did not journey. So it was when the cloud was above the tabernacle a few days, according to the command of Jehovah, they would remain encamped, and according to the command of Jehovah, they would journey. So it was when the cloud remained only from evening until morning. When the cloud was taken up in the morning, then they would journey, and whether by day or by night, whenever the cloud was taken up, they would journey. Whether it was two days, a month, or a year that the cloud remained above the tabernacle, the children of Israel would remain encamped and not journey, but when it was taken up, they would journey. And at the command of Jehovah, they remained encamped, and at the command of Jehovah, they journeyed, and they kept the charge of Jehovah at the command of Jehovah by the hand of Moses. Now, that's a lot of verses to say basically one thing. When the glory cloud lifted and it moved, they moved, and when it stayed put, they stayed put. But I think our Father in Heaven is like emphasizing the fact, and I, again, I don't want to dwell on this because we could make a whole teaching on this alone, but he's dwelling on the, uh, emphasizing the fact that when I tell you to do something, you do it. When I tell you not to do something, you don't do it. When I tell you to move at the command of my servants or the Ruach HaKodesh, the Holy Spirit, you move. Otherwise, you stay put and you wait patiently. And that's something we're all learning to do. It may, may look like we need to move um, at times when he has said not to move or to not move when he has told us to move. And that's something that we're all having to work on and learn to do. And there's many, many places in the Psalms, for example, that talk about waiting on the Lord, waiting on Jehovah. And how hard that is to do, especially for some of us guys that tend to be impetuous and impatient and gung-ho and want to go out. It's, it's very, very easy to, to move out when he hasn't said to move out. And then we end up doing so in the flesh. And that's a whole other discussion in itself. And we could probably talk about that one for an hour or two. 
and many of us have experiences and testimonies that we could give of where we have moved out when Yah said not to move, and things didn't go so well, and vice versa. So anyway, uh, that's, those are the two things we want to talk about, um, among other things. So now I'm going to switch over to the, um, to the screen share and see, hopefully this will work. Uh, where's my Okino right here? Share. Okay. So let me go up here. Okay. I hope, and I'm going to go to, uh, and I'm sorry for those of you on YouTube, you're not able to see this. I will describe what we are looking at. Um, and, uh, and I apologize, but, uh, I hope you will still be blessed. Uh, I'm going to move to full screen. View. Uh, come on. Oh, play. Got to go to play. There we go. Okay. So, um, Donna, can you come in and just let me know, make sure that everybody can, can you see that all right? On the computer. It should be, it should say Mishkan and, and have a picture of the tabernacle. Do you see? I can see it. Okay, great. And I'll, we'll just do a test. Can you, did that open up to the next window? Okay, good, good. Okay, good. Hallelujah. We got our technology down. So um, what we're going to do is I'm going to take you on a little tour of the tabernacle. And um, this is, this is an artist's rendition of the tabernacle. Uh, and it shows the tabernacle and the, the outer courtyard. And this is a, actually a very inaccurate rendition because the, and actually I know the guy, I don't know if he's still alive, but I know the guy that painted this picture. In fact, I've got a picture. Oh no, not this one. That's another one. This is some, another picture. Anyway, um, I forget. I don't know the guy. I, we got the permission from the fellow who, who did this one uh, to, to use it. Uh, it's on the internet, but we actually got permission. Anyway, the artist who did it, but uh, in this picture, it shows the children of Israel encamped around the um, tabernacle. Well, that's inaccurate because A, they would have been camped in the, in the position of a cross or the Pedio letter Hebrew Tav. It looks like our small T and they would have been camped a ways. The Levites themselves would have been camped uh, right around. And maybe, maybe this is the, a picture of the Levites, but they would have been camped around it and the priests would have been camped at the door. I think we talked about that last time. Uh, I won't get into that again. So um, th this is uh, from Psalm 77, 13, which says, Thy way, O Elohim, is in the sanctuary, or the Kodesh. Kodesh is another word. Uh, it's a Hebrew word for the holy place. And the so you, the tabernacle of Moses, or it was called the Mishkan, had an outer courtyard that was, um, I think it was about 50 feet by 75 feet, if I remember correctly, in size. And then you had the, um, no, I think that was actually the um, tabernacle. I forget, forget. I'm, we're not getting into the dimensions of the tabernacle right now. That's that's another discussion because I'll I'll probably say things that are inaccurate unless I'm looking at my exact notes. But anyway, the tabernacle itself that sat inside the courtyard uh, was called the 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 sanctuary or the kadosh or or a kado, uh, uh, the kadosh uh, or the holy place in our Bibles is termed holy place. Now inside the holy place you had the holy of holies or called the kadosh hakadoshim. It had several names: holy of holies or also the oracle or the devir in Hebrew. We'll talk about that in a little bit. So thy way, O Elohim, is in the sanctuary, in the tabernacle. So in the tabernacle of Moses, not only just in the tabernacle, but the t including the tabernacle courtyard, which contained the um, altar of burnt sacrifice, or the altar, the, the, the burnt offering altar, uh, but also the, the um, uh, bronze laver, uh, we'll talk about those in a minute. It all pictured the plan of salvation and the steps that everybody has to take if they want to come into relationship with their Father in heaven. And it's all through Yeshua, Jesus, Yeshua the Messiah. And it's by way of the cross. There's no other way. And we've done a lot of, I've done a lot of videos on the tabernacle and all that it represents. I'm not going to get into a lot of details on that at this point in time. I've already done 
multiple videos and teachings on that. So the major themes of the tabernacle are, let's go back here, I jumped the gun. Man going from spirit, from a spiritual state of being profane or polluted to being kadosh or set apart, going from darkness to light and disobedience to obedience. Next bullet item. These are the major themes in the tabernacle. It's, it's, it's about progressive separation and refinement of the individual leading to purity and perfection. The individual growing in progressive intimacy and fellowship with the Father in heaven. And of course, it's through a relationship with Yeshua, the, 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 the Messiah, the Son of Elohim. Um, and it's through the Spirit, the Ruach HaKodesh, the Spirit of Elohim. We'll talk about that more later. It's also the steps of the biblical wedding ceremony, along with the marriage of Yahweh to his people, are outlined in the tabernacle. So I'm not really going to get into that too much today. That's not the point of it, but it, it is outlined. The seven steps of, the, of spiritual growth and reconciliation to the Father as epitomized or symbolized by the seven annual appointed times or festivals or Moedim are outlined in the tabernacle. So the seven feasts of the Lord are all there. And we will talk a little bit more about that. So... Uh, we have this Dr. Seuss, um, it's like a machine uh, that you go in, it's like a conveyor belt thing. You go in, uh, uh, you, want, you know, you go in the beginning of it and you come out a whole different thing. So the Mishkan is like a spiritual factory in, in with the uncleaned and the rough and the raw material and out with the refined polished product. Or I have another clip here of a di um, a rough diamond going in man starts as a raw uncut rough precious stone and comes out as a cut smooth polished priceless gem formed in the image of yeshua so you just think of it, it it's a processing plant <laughs> to take us sinners who are separated from elohim and bring us into a relationship and the tabernacle pictures that and i said this again and again and again lamentably lamenting why does the christian church not teach these things this is the most beautiful wonderful biblical tract in the bible it's a three-dimensional multi actually more than that multi-dimensional uh gospel tract well, I'll tell you why. Because if they did, they'd have to start keeping kosher, keeping the Shabbat, doing the feast days, because it's all in there. And they'd have to get more Hebraic in their understandings. And boy, the church, most of the people in the church don't want anything to do with that. Uh, there's a few people that are coming out of that false paradigm and are beginning to walk more Torah-centric, Hebraic, you know, as Yeshua and the early apostles did. But when the church became... Uh, eventually became the Roman Catholic Church. They let go of all that, and they substituted, sadly, a lot of, a lot of counterfeits uh, for, the, um, you know, for the truth of Elohim, and that's what's in the church today. Now, when I say counterfeits, I'm not talking about the basic gospel message, the message of Yeshua and the cross and salvation by grace through faith. They maintained that, but sadly, they, they, they cut out a lot of the other things about holiness and righteousness, and they substitute a lot of other things. We've talked about that. At length, we won't go into uh, uh, into more details on that. So here is a, we're going to look at a quick overview of the tabernacle. So here we see, um, and I don't have a cursor available to me, or maybe I do. Can you see the cursor? Can you shake your head? Okay, great, good. So here we have, this is the door of the tabernacle right here. And this is, this is now you can see the children of Israel camped around uh, by numbers, they're camped around the outside of the tabernacle in the form of a cross. And this says that in Numbers, the beginning of Numbers, it says they were, you know, three of the tribes were camped in the north, three in the east, three in the west, and three in the south. And by numbers, they form a perfect cross. So it's a cross on a cross because we see that the, that the implements in the tabernacle are shaped more or less like a cross too. You got the glory cloud and the Ark of the Covenant at the top, and you go straight down, straight line down to the to the uh, 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 bronze altar, or, and then and then you have the menorah on the left hand side and the table of showbread on the right hand side, and it forms 
like a, a cross. So we have a cross on a cross, and we've talked about that before. That's a picture of the, the saint actually becoming, when we, when we come to salvation, we've got to go to the cross with Yeshua. And baptism is a picture of that. It's a packed picture of death, burial, and resurrection, just like Yeshua did, crucifying, dying to the old man, the old self, the old woman, the sin nature, and becoming a new creation. So it's a picture of, of our being buried, death, burial, and resurrection, and then being raised alive as a new creation in Yeshua to live and walk out the way he lived and walked out. Not just talk about him. Oh, I love you, Jesus. You know, I'm talking to you, Jesus, and I'm worshiping you, Jesus, but actually do what he did and live how he lived, which takes us back into the Torah because that's what he did. Okay, let's go to the next slide. Oh, well, and then we have, before we do that, this little box outside, that is the altar of the red heifer. And that's very, very important. And we're going to talk briefly about that. That's outside the tabernacle. And then when you come in the door of the tabernacle, we'll talk about that. Then you come, first thing you come to in the outer courtyard is the, the um, altar of sacrifice. And then you come to the bronze laver that was full of water. Uh, was a washing station and you come into the tabernacle itself and then you have uh, on the on the west is the uh, actually that's the south side or the left side as you're going in you have the menorah the seven branch menorah, menorah and then you have the table of showbread with the 12 loaves of unleavened bread and then you then you uh, directly above that just before the veil that goes into the holy of holies you have the um, uh, the uh, altar uh, altar of incense and then you come in here and you have the um, uh, inside the Holy of Holies, you have the Ark of the Covenant, and and then uh, with the mercy seat on top of that, and then over the top of that, you have the glory cloud. So, uh, and which is, that's what was hovering over. That's what you see here in this little picture of the tabernacle with the, the flames over the top, okay? So now, well, let's take a quick look at the altar of the red heifer. Uh, this, like I pointed, that's that little blue box just outside we don't know exactly where it was. I just put the blue box there, but it was outside the tabernacle. And we go to uh, Hebrews chapter 13, and it talks about going outside uh, where the altar of the red heifer was, and that's where Yeshua was crucified. He was not crucified at the church of the Holy Sepulchre or any of that. He was crucified outside of New, outside of Jerusalem. And he, in ancient times, uh, during the Second Temple period, they actually... Uh, it was up on the Mount of Olives where they would, where the altar of the red heifer was across the Kidron Valley up on the altar, up on the um, Mount of Olives. And, and, and uh, Alfred Edersheim talks about that in one of his books. And I think he may be quoting either the Talmud or the Mishnah on that. So anyway, uh, and it says here in, um, uh, I'm turning to it, Hebrews 12. I'll get there. I think it's 13 actually. Or is it 12? I always forget. I think it's, it's 13. It says, Therefore, verse 12, Therefore, G Jesus, or Yeshua also, that he might sanctify the people with his own blood, suffered outside the gate. That's the gate, gates of, the, of, the, of Jerusalem. Therefore, let us go forth to him outside the camp, bearing his reproach. Um, so anyway, this is a picture. The red heifer is a picture of where Yeshua was crucified. And we have to meet him outside the tabernacle. The tabernacle is a picture of salvation. You can't come into the tabernacle until you're washed in the blood and cleaned and sanctified. And you got to meet Yeshua as a sinner out, uh, out there at the altar of the red heifer. Get clean, cleansed of death, which is what the red heifer altar uh, sacrifice represented uh they would take the ashes and mix them with with uh water which you formed a lye water and 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 put some other things in there and you were washed with that uh, because we were all dead and being defiled by by being a dead body or touching a dead body and this was uh how the priests were purified and we are called to be kings and priests i'm going over this very quickly i'm sorry but uh if you want to look more into this you'll you can go read my articles on all this and we go into a lot more detail Anyway, so this is the place where people would meet Yeshua is at the altar of the red heifer. And then, then they would come in the door. Oh, I guess that's, that's a picture of the all, uh, well, that's a picture of the red heifer being, being killed. And we got some, uh, and so I already, I guess I already, um, uh, talked about those things. 
an unsaved one, uh, an unsaved person is in a state of spiritual separation, darkness, and hopelessness. One sees the good news, the light of the truth, the need for redemption, the multicolored door, and luminescent walls of the tabernacle. To enter the tabernacle, one must first visit the altar of the red heifer, the cross of Yeshua located outside the tabernacle. The red heifer was a sin offering, and his ashes were used to bring about ritual purification for uncleanliness. The Passover lamb was killed outside the house. Yeshua, the lamb of Elohim, was crucified outside of Jerusalem and atoned for our sins through his shed blood. He brought us to a state of ritual purity so that we could enter into a relationship with the Father pictured through our entering the tabernacle. Hallelujah. So there I have a picture of... I have a picture of the uh, Temple Mount that I took when I was in Israel. And so the Temple Mount, right where the Dome of the Rock is here, that's the tabernacle, or the temple was just on the other side of that. And this is the Mount of Olives uh, across the Kidron Valley. It would have been to the to the uh, uh, east. And the uh, altar of the Red Heifer would have been up in here probably somewhere, if, as I recall. I, anyway, it, it, it would have been a straight line. Uh, well, I'm not going to get into all the details. Okay. Um, oh, actually, I do have it <laughs> here. This is this is the all this is the dome of the spirits, and the eastern gate would have been right over here. Uh, um, oh, I'm sorry, that's the next slide. Here's the dome of the spirits, and this is probably where the the Solomon's Temple actually stood uh, in ancient times, and and the eastern gate would have been straight to the east, and it would have been actually uh, right up here. This is a, a tower. I think it was a, um, I forget the name of it, and it would have been a straight line, and that's where there was a bridge over the Kidron Valley, and that's uh, the, this bridge, it was a, 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 a bridge that was uh, destroyed uh, by the Romans, but it was actually, uh, they, it was a causeway or a bridge, and that's where they led the, the, the red heifer altar. Here you can see the next slide, you can actually see the straight line right looking from the Dome of the Spirits. This is actual pavement of Solomon's Temple, as best we know. This is actual rock. This is probably where the Holy of Holies was. And you, it's a straight line looking straight across. Oh, that's, let's get to the next slide. Straight across, and and apparently the Altar of the Red Heifer was up in here somewhere, a straight line straight through, because it had to be there, because remember the Roman guard he was able to, when he, after Yeshua was crucified, they saw from the place of the crucifixion, they saw the temple, the curtain in the temple was rent. Uh, and the door, front door would have been facing that way. And they would have been able to look in and see the rent uh, curtain uh, there in the temple from the place of Yeshua's crucifixion. That's why all the other places, whether it's the, 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 the tomb of the skull, Golgotha, or the or the um, the t the traditional garden tomb, or the what the Catholics believe at the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. That's why that couldn't have been that couldn't have been the spot because it doesn't match up with Scripture. That's just traditions of men. Okay, so then you come in the door of the tabernacle. It's the four colors which represent um, the um, Yeshua, and um, the outer gate was made of a fine linen with crimson. A blue purple threads woven into white linen and it's a picture of the four gospels and the four aspects of yeshua his blue is his 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 divinity and he's from heaven uh, red is the, the color red is his humanity and his blood uh, purple is his uh, royalty uh, he's king and in white is his righteousness and holiness um so i'm not gonna i will skip over that real fast uh i thought these slides were Oh, I thought I had, I thought I had closed these slides down. Um, maybe not. We're going to get, get through this real fast here. I want to get in. Okay, so here's the door. They were to come in through the door of the tabernacle, which represents Yeshua. He said, I am the door. The door was uh, about 30 feet wide and seven and a half feet tall. And they would have come to the altar of sacrifice. So this does not picture, now I've never heard anybody teach this, but this is my understanding. This does not actually picture, it pictures the cross, but not the initial place where people come to when they first get saved. Otherwise, you'd have impure sinners coming to the tabernacle, and that's not possible. Uh, many people who teach about the tabernacle, they have sinners coming in. But my Bible says that if the priest came in in an unwashed, unpurified state, 
they were dead. So you had to get purified outside. And then you, when you come into the tabernacle, then you can have the peace offering. And there's five different types of offerings and one drink offering. So six altogether. And, uh, but I believe that the, the bronze laver is a picture of the cross, but it's also once you're saved, you got to keep coming back to the cross. You got to keep repenting of your sins. You've got to, you've got to keep the, 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 the idea of the crucified life, the crucified Yeshua in your viewpoint and in your perspective so that, so that whenever you are, you know, you fall, you sin, you get tempted, you, you, you know, even as a saint, you come back and you ask for forgiveness and you get covered in the blood of Yeshua all over again. And again, I don't have time to go into all of that. The, a lot of things happened. The, the, the menorah was lit from coals from, from the, from, from this, um, altar, the, um, um, the bed, the bread on the table of showbread was baked here. Uh, the altar of incense coals were, were brought from this altar and were, um, and then incense was sprinkled on them and you, you had incense going up, which is a picture of, of prayer and, and worship as the book of Revelation tells us and elsewhere. Again, I don't have a lot of time to go into this. And these are some of the instruments that they used for, for uh, tending the fires there. So this is the altar of sacrifice. Uh, I'm not going to get into what it was made of. It's all pictures, Yeshua, and so forth and so on. Next, we come to the bronze. Oh, let me just say, the, the altar of sacrifice, uh, the 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 um, um, altar of the red heifer is a picture of Passover, and then the first day of unleavened bread is a picture of. It's pass okay. Passover part one and Passover part two. So the lamb was crucified outside the house, outside the house on the first Passover, and that's a picture of of initial salvation. You meet Yeshua as you are at the cross, and then you bring you come into the house. They brought the lamb into the house there in Egypt uh, at the first Passover, and that's a picture of going into the tabernacle. You're in a saved state, uh, in a sense, um, and. Um, and that's a picture also of the uh, coming into the presence of Elohim under his grace. The death angel passed over. And that's also a picture of the bronze uh, altar uh, in the tabernacle. But it also, um, it's also where a, a, a saint has to live under the blood of Yeshua all the time. Because if, we're, if we get out from under the blood of Yeshua, then we're a sitting duck for the enemy. Because now he's got something to accuse us of because we have sinned and we're not under the blood. But also we need to be under the blood because the Father in heaven sees us through the blood of Yeshua, uh, the, the altar, the lamb. And he sees us with the righteousness of Yeshua on us. I'm going through this very quickly. Forgive me. I hope I'm not losing anybody. Anyway, there's many scriptures we could give. I just don't have time to tag all those bases right now. So the next thing we come to, oh, and that that the bronze laver is a picture of of um, uh, the first day of unleavened bread uh, is Passover and unleavened bread because Passover night overlaps into, or the Seder night overlaps into the day of unleaven, days of unleavened bread or the feast of unleavened bread, and so um, because we're celebrating the, the Passover at the end of the fourteenth, into the fifteenth day of the first month, which is the beginning the, the, of the first high holy day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread, which lasts for seven days. You can go read about that in Leviticus twenty-three. The bronze laver is the next thing you come to, and that's a picture of baptism for the remission of sins. And it was on the last day of unleavened bread that the children of Israel were baptized unto Moses when they went through the Red Sea on the last day of unleavened bread. So they were leaving Egypt on the first day of unleavened bread, and then on the seventh day they were um, uh, they were going through the Red Sea. And they were, as it says in uh, somewhere in the New Testament, it says they were baptized unto Moses. I think it's in 1 Corinthians, or one of Paul's writings. So the bronze laver is a picture of the, uh, f uh, well, let's look at, um, hell, I am not going to go through all that. They washed your hands. It's, it's, a, it's a place of cleansing, being washed by the Spirit, receiving the Spirit, baptism, or, or, or receiving the Holy Spirit when you are baptized, and, 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 and being washed in the water of the Word, and it's where blood and water was mixed, and this is a picture of, 
and again, I don't have time to get into all these symbolisms, but anyway, um, it, it's basically, it's a picture of being washed, cleansed, and renewed by the word and the spirit of Elohim. Okay, then we go into the tabernacle itself. I, there, okay, we're going to skip all those slides. And here we come, <clears throat> this is the, okay, this is the tabernacle. Um, I, we already looked at this slide, so I'm going to go past it. Oh, I'm sorry. I, for some reason, these were, um, there we go, the door. I, these were supposed to be, um, um, it's not showing up on Zoom. Okay, here we are. They were, they were supposed to be, um, those slides, we were supposed to skip them. So here we are at the menorah. So the menorah was constructed of a solid gold ingot and stood on the south or the left side um, of the holy place. So the next biblical feast after Passover and unleavened bread is Pentecost, Shavuot, which is coming up. We will be celebrating that tomorrow. And the menorah is a picture of that. Remember I said earlier that the that the the feasts are a uh, are prefigured in the seven steps in the tabernacle, the seven furnishings in the tabernacle. It has seven branches made to resemble almond blossoms. The wicks of the menorah made of linen and the purest olive oil was placed in the gold cups. The menorah was clean, cleaned in the morning and relit in the afternoon. Each branch leaned or pointed toward the central stem. So there were the six side branches, which six is the number of humanity, pointed to Yeshua. It was called the Shamish, or the candle. And that was the first candle that was lit. And then all the other candles traditionally were lit from that center candle. Actually, from that center um, flame. And it wasn't really actually a candle. It was a wick. And that picture is that, that's a picture that, that we are supposed to lean to and point to Yeshua. And that we are to receive our fire and our flame from him. Remember, he said that he must go away in John 16. Uh, and he would send, 15 and 16, and he would send the Holy Spirit, the Comforter, the Parakletos, to to help us. We'll talk about that a little bit later. So here's a, here's a couple pictures of the of the menorah. And here's some of the things that they used to, uh, to take care of the menorah, to clean it and pour oil into it and all of that. They had to clean the wicks, trim the wicks, all that stuff. The menorah is a picture of Yeshua, the tree of life. The six stems represent the redeemed who are grafted into Yeshua and point to him. The oil represents the Torah and the spirit. You know, a lot of people in the Christian church, they realize that the, that the, that the olive oil represents the spirit, but it also represents the Torah. And again, I, I don't have time to go into that, but we do, we do talk about that um, in, in some of my other teachings. The flames, which are the heat and the light, represent the fruits and the gifts of the spirit. Um, so the flame is the light by which the world sees us. Remember, Yeshua said, by this, all men shall know that you are my disciples. If you have love one for another. And love is kind of the, the chief fruit in all uh, of the spirit. And all the other fruits really come out of that. The fruit of the spirit of Galatians chapter 5. Um, but the, the, so that's the light. But then if you, you know, you put your hand over the top of a, of a flame, you're going to get burned because there's power there. It's that it's that heat that runs in an internal combustion engine. It's the explosion, the explosive power, or uh, the heat that uh, heats a steam engine so that a, a piston can move back and forth. Heat is power, and so that is a picture of the gifts of the spirit. The gifts of the spirit as uh, that are the result of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. So when we're Re regenerated by the Spirit, begotten by the Spirit, uh, at the time of our conversion, then we need to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit, and that's the gifts of the Spirit, which we receive, the, the nine gifts of the Spirit that uh, 1 Corinthians uh, 12 talks about, and those are for the purposes, not of just bragging to your neighbor about you know, how great I am because I can speak in tongues and I can pray over people and they get healed and I can, you know, speak prophetic words. But it's for the purpose of going out and gathering in the harvest, for expanding the kingdom. You know, the devil's got a lot of power. He can do all kinds of things. He can. He's the God of this world. He has natural power and supernatural power. So Yah has not sent out his people without supernatural power too. And that's the gifts of the Spirit. 
to go up against demonic spirits, to heal the sick, to cast demons out, to speak prophetically into situations. And those of us that have ministered on the streets and in the, and, and in the mission field and out there where the lost are, many of us have experienced the movings of the gifts, the moving of the gifts of the spirit is a wonderful thing when lives are, are when the powers of darkness are confronted with the power of the Holy Spirit and people get set free. Hallelujah. The next thing we come to, uh, and that's a picture of Shavuot. Remember Shavuot. Let's go back a slide. Shavuot was um, was when not only when they received uh, the children of Israel. Well, the Bible doesn't specifically say that uh, the Matan or the giving of the Torah at Mount Sinai happened on Shavuot, but it it mentions that it was in the third month, the beginning of the third month, which is when. Shavuot was in its Jewish tradition, so we just kind of assume that's when it happened. But that's also, um, that's when the children of Israel received the Torah, the Torah, the instructions of Jehovah, written on stone with his finger, written in stone. Something that's written in stone cannot be changed. You've heard the saying, oh, that was written, the saying, that was written, that's written in stone. That means it cannot be changed. Well, sadly, the church has come along and said, well, it can be changed, and it has been changed. Well, we we rebuke that error. We come against that error because that's not, it's contrary to the scripture and it's contrary to the spirit. And it certainly does line up with the agendas of the snake and the tree, the serpent that deceived Adam and Eve and, and then um, got them to deny and disobey the, the, the simple, com several simple commandments. There were actually five to be, in, in, to be exact that Yovah gave the uh, Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, and six, if you want to include the Sabbath, it wasn't a command, but he he it was it was an example that they were to follow his example when he rested on the seventh day. So anyway, um, uh, so on the day of Pentecost, they received the um, Holy Spirit, the Ruach Hakodesh, that wrote the laws of Elohim on their hearts. It says in um, Acts chapter 2 that they were cut in their spirit when they heard Peter preach that sermon. They were convicted. They were cut in their spirit. And I believe that's when they received, as per um, Jeremiah's prophecy in Jeremiah 31, verse 31 and 33, they said, I will give them a new heart and write my laws on their hearts. So this time they will be able to do them, unlike the children of Israel who had to die in the wilderness because they were a stiff-necked and a rebellious generation. We can go read about that in Hebrews chapter 4. That's why they weren't. the older generation was not allowed or permitted to go into the promised land because that was the old man, the old rebellious man that did not want to follow the laws of Elohim. I would not want to be a preacher that said, we don't have to do these things anymore. I was talking to a a young man just the other day who used to attend our congregation when we had a local congregation and then he backslid and then he came back and he left the congregation he backslid and I never heard from him again and he got back in touch with us and he got married and had a baby and and now he's like really walking with the Lord he really wants to serve and obey him and uh, and and he wants to reconnect. It's, it's beautiful, and and he remembers the teachings and the congregation and everything. Uh, and he, you know, but he backslid. He went into drugs. He went into all kinds of stuff. And then he he went in the pit. He went in the pig pen, <laughs> the prodigal son pig pen. And now he's come back and he's zealous. And anyway, he's he's attending. Sadly, he's attending a local messianic congregation that's been around for quite a while, and they claim to be. To one degree or another, be Torah observant. They they wear talits and they they dress up and they do all the you know Jewish stuff. And this last Shabbat, it was last week. The um, one of the teachers in the congregation, you know, got up and and they're, they're messianic. Okay, so they're, they're they're whatever that's supposed to mean. It, it it's, it's a messy situation. Okay, it's just what it is. And the pastor got up. It wasn't the pastor. It was like the assistant pastor or the head elder. He got up and gave a sermon. And at the end of it, he goes, he goes, and thank God we're not, or, you know, we're not under the law anymore. We don't have to do these things. And all the congregation clapped and yay. And my friend, this young man, he goes, he was like sick. He wanted to get up and leave because he knew that was false. And he just like, 
and he went up afterwards and queried the guy. Did you really mean that? Is this what he wanted to clarify? Is this what you meant that the law was done away with and that Christ fulfilled the law so we don't have to? And he goes, yep, that's exactly what I meant. I would not want to be in these, this man's shoes, especially when they're claiming to be messianic and be sh revealing the more Hebraic side of things. And to get up there and say that, I, I pray that he repents and that he confesses his sin publicly because he, he, he made this grievous error publicly. Anyway, that's going on all over the place. And many of you were in churches like that in the past and you're not part of that anymore. Hallelujah. But that's part of what Yah, he wrote the Torah on their hearts on the day of Pentecost. It wasn't done away with. It was a fulfillment of prophecy. Not just on the Jews, the tribe of Judah, but on all the, the, um, all the tribes. This is what it says here. Let's go back here to Jeremiah. Uh, you all know this, I'm sure. Jeremiah 31. He goes... I can almost quote it from, Behold, the day is coming. <laughs> um, uh, Behold, the days are coming, says Jehovah, when I will make a new covenant. Hello, this is the new covenant, all my Christian brothers and sisters out there. The new covenant you like to talk about that, that supposedly does away with the old covenant, including the law of Moses. He says, Behold, the new, the new covenant uh, the day is coming when I'll make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. We're talking about two different people groups here. They're all part of Israel, but Judah is the southern kingdom. That was the, the, the those were the Jews that lived in Judea and the southern kingdom before, when it split at the time of uh, Rehoboam, the the son of Solomon, and the house of Israel. Not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand and led them out of Egypt. My covenant which they broke. Though I was a husband to them, says Jehovah. By this the covenant, by this the covenant that I will make with but this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days. I will put my laws in their minds and write it on their hearts. And I will be their Elohim, and they shall be my people. So how can Elohim write his laws on our hearts? And then we turn around and say, oh, we don't need to do them anymore. Jesus did it for us. I mean, how does that make sense? It doesn't make sense. This is the hogwash and the garbage that's being taught in the pulpits for the last 1,800 years in Christendom. And then we go, well, well uh, we're not the Jews, so it doesn't apply to us. Oh, he said he's going to make a new covenant. A new covenant. Well, who's he making the new covenant with? Just the Jews, not the Gentiles? Hello? Okay, I wasn't even going to get into this, but I, I feel the need to. We get to Hebrews 8. And he quotes this. Hebrews 8, the writer says, he quotes Jeremiah 31. 31 and 33, and he says, and then we go down to verse 10. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days. So it's all the Israelites. It says that you have all, I will put my laws in their mind and write them in their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. And then it goes down here. In, um, So he's making the new covenant with the house of Israel. He doesn't mention anything about the Gentiles here. Well, does that mean the Gentiles are without a covenant? Well, let's go here over here to Ephesians chapter 2. And this is these are major truths that the church has... I want to pull my hair out. My passion and my zeal burns up inside of me. It's like, hello, wake up. This is so blatantly obvious but you know when your eyes are blind you can't see you've been blinded by the traditions of men and by the by the by the false teachers in the pulpit and 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 been brainwashed but here we read in Ephesians 2 verse 11 one that you've heard me probably read many times verse 11 therefore remember that you once 
Gentiles in the flesh. So he's not talking to the Jews. He's not talking to anybody that identified genetically with the tribes of Israel. He's talking to the Gentiles who are called uncircumcision by that by what is called circumcision, made in the flesh by hand. So the Jews call you uncircumcised, is what he's saying. That at that time, when you were Gentiles in the flesh, you were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise. What are the covenants of promise? The Abrahamic covenant. It's, remember, it's covenants plural. The Abrahamic covenant, the Mosaic covenant, and the new covenant that he said he would make. You were aliens. You were outside that. It did not pertain to you. You were aliens. You were not part of the commonwealth or the nation of Israel. These covenants did not pertain to you. They do not pertain to you. They only pertain to Israel. They do not pertain to anybody outside of Israel. So what? how do the Gentiles become part of this these salvation covenants and so forth, the, the you know covenants of holiness and righteousness. You see, you were aliens from the commonwealth or the nationhood or the citizenship of Israel, strangers from the covenants of promise, with having no hope and without God in the world. So when you were Gentiles, you had no hope, no hope of salvation, no hope of life after death, no hope of redemption from your sins. You were dead in your sins and you were headed for the lake of fire. Okay. And um, and you were without God. You didn't even know him. You didn't even know him. But, but, hallelujah, one of the biggest little words in the, words in the English language. But now in Christ, you who were once afar off, you were outside of the nation of Israel. You were you were totally outside of this whole covenant thing, but now you were who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Yeshua, for He Himself is our peace, who has been, who has made both one, both Jews and Gentiles one. So when people tell me, they say, "Well, why are you doing all this Jewish stuff? Are you Jewish?" No, I'm not Jewish, not that I know of. Well, why are you doing that? You're a Gentile. I said, "Uh, uh." I'm not a Gentile. Yes, you are. No, I'm not. I, I yell and scream at them. I am not without God and without hope. I am not outside the covenants or the commonwealth or the promises of Israel. I am not outside of from being underneath the blood of Yeshua. You can call yourself whatever you want, but I am not a Gentile any longer in, in the sense that he's using it here. Without God and without hope. I argue with them and I walk away. I said, no, nope. end of discussion. You know, you can, I'm like, no, not going there. See, if they can claim that they're Gentiles and they can claim that they don't have to follow the law and they, by the same token, they can also, they, they're not saved. And if they want to claim that they're Gentiles, then that means they're outside the covenants. You see how everything Either it's either one way or the other. There's no middle ground. For he himself is our peace who has made, this is Ephesians 2.14, made both one and has broken down the middle wall of separation, having abolished in his flesh the enemy that is the law of commandments contained in ordinance. This is not referring to the Torah. This is referring to probably, you know, there's the there's books. There's the book of life, and if there's a book of life, there's a book of the dead. You know, the Bible talks about the books were opened. We know about the book of life. The other books don't have names. But if there's a book of life, there's probably a book of the dead where our sins and stuff are recorded against us. And then they're blotted out when we get saved and come under the blood of Yeshua. Okay? So, um, the um, when we get saved, all of that past record of our past sins is gone. And it says here, and, and he's created in himself the one new man from two. So he's taken the Jews, and he's taken the non-Jews, and he's made the one new man, where there's neither now Greek 
nor Jew, Jew or Gentile, but the one new man, what we might call redeemed Israel or the Israel of God. That he might reconcile them both to God in one body through the Christ, to the cross, thereby putting to death the enmity. So anyway, you get the point here. It's a beautiful, beautiful picture. That's what did, happened on the day of Pentecost. And it says here in Acts chapter 2, I read that, or I, I, I mentioned it, I didn't actually read it. But it says after uh, Paul preached the sermon, it says they were cut to the heart. Or not Paul, it was Peter. Uh, it says, verse 37. Now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? This is on the day of Pentecost. Then Peter answered them and said, Repent. Repent of what? Um, saying bad words. Um, going to movies. Of thinking bad thoughts of not being nice to my neighbor of of uh, you know think of the things that that the church calls sin now a lot of a lot of them are are sin uh just ju justly so but a lot of the things that the bible calls sin the church ignores okay because first john 3 4 says a sin is a repentance uh, uh, sin is a violation of the Torah. So when he said repent, he's talking about repent of sin or of Torahlessness. That's the Jewish biblical Hebrew context that Paul or that Peter the Jew would have been talking about. R repenting of breaking the letter of the law and the spirit of the law, as Yeshua talks about in the Sermon on the Mount. Repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Yeshua the Messiah for the remission of sins. There again, sin, Torlessness. 1 John 3, 4. And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit for the promises to you and to your children and to all who are far off, as many as God, the Lord God will choose, regardless of what your ethnic origin is. Because once you're brought in, you get grafted in to Israel, and now you're part of the nation of Israel. And the new covenant with all of its promises and its blessings apply to you and to me. Could that be any clearer? I've just given you, I know I'm preaching at the choir here. You all get this, and, and YouTube too, some of you. The rest of you, this may be new information to you that your pastor never talked to you about. And if so, well, time to get a new pastor or kick a two-by-four and slap him across the face and wake him up. No, not literally, but you know what I mean. You know, I mean, anyway. Let may the Spirit lead you. Okay, let's go to the next slide. I'm on slide. So now we come to the the table of showbread. We're not going to spend a lot of time on that. That that's a that was the next thing in the tabernacle, and that was a cross from the um, that was a cross from the um, uh, menorah, and that represents. Um, coming into unity, all the tribes of Israel coming into unity. Uh, and, you know, some of us don't know which tribe we're going to belong to, but we or what we will belong to. But we know that that the, the 12 gates in the New Jerusalem are named after the 12 tribes of Israel. And they will, um, there's no Gentile gate. Go to Re uh, Revelation 21, verse 12, I think it is. There's no Gentile gate. So Gentiles aren't getting into New Jerusalem, which is a picture of heaven. Okay, guys, just face it. You, those of you that call yourself a Gentile, you're not getting in there. Not, not, I mean, there's no place for you to go. <laughs> it doesn't mean you're not saved, but you've got a wrong idea in your brain. Okay, you really do. You're, 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 you're letting false teachings uh, color your thinking on this whole issue. And it's affecting your walk and affecting your beliefs and affecting your relationship with Yeshua. But the table of showbread is a picture of the, um, the bread. Yeshua is the bread of life. Every Shabbat, the uh, fresh bread was put on there. So that meant that, you know, they received fresh bread, uh, fresh word from Elohim. That's why I like to give fresh teachings every Shabbat. I don't, you know, regurgitate the same ones I've done over and over again. I could come up with new ones or at least um, 
you know, some of the same information, but, but, but given a little differently. And, um, so it's fresh manna as, as the, as the Holy Spirit inspires me, but it's talking about the regathering of Israel. So they, they all coming together to worship Yeshua, the 12 tribes coming together, which is what the 12 loaves of uh, represented on there. I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about the table of show, uh, table of showbread. There's some of the things that were, um, aspects uh, of the table of showbread that were that were uh you know what, what it might look like now this is a really bad picture because this shows leavened bread um <laughs> it was actually it was flat bread there was no leavening in it that shows that the saints are in a sin, uh, sin free state uh if they're deleavened okay next we come to the altar of incense and that's a picture of um it was located in front of the veil that went into the tab a holy of holies and it was made of, okay, a quick case you would covered in gold. And that's a picture of Yeshua, but a picture of how we should be. We're, we're human beings made out of wood in a certain sense. Uh, it's a picture of humanity. But we're covered in the righteousness, the gold of Yeshua. Uh, it's a picture of righteousness. And the, the priests offered up incense twice a day, morning and evening. That picture is that we should be offering up incense of our prayers and our worship morning and evening. That speaks to our morning and evening the devotionals. And I hope that we're all getting disciplined in these things because it really is very important. Very, very important to, to do these things. Um, and it's very pleasing. In the book of Revelation, in Revelation chapter 5 and 8, it says there are like golden bowls with incense coming up. Your prayers are like golden bowls with incense coming up. It's a sweet-smelling um, odor or aroma in the nostrils of Elohim. You know, I can just imagine... We got billions of people on this earth, most of whom hate God or are oblivious to him. And many of them are just literally actively against him and just, just like, you know, just fighting him. It must grieve his heart. Here he's given us this beautiful earth. He's given us his son. He's given us, you know, Yeshua. He's given us the gospel message the potential for eternal life free of charge. He's given us the food, the water, everything we have. And people are shaking their fists at him. It must really bless him when there's a few people on the earth that are actually, I love you, Yeshua, and they're worshiping and praising him. And Can you imagine if you had, if you were a parent and you had, you know, all, all your children and they're all cursing and damning you and, and, and going against what you taught them and they're ungrateful and you have one child out of the whole you know bunch of them that loves the Lord and, and really wants to honor you and or, you know loves you and appreciates what you've done for them. You just imagine how that would bless your heart. Well, I'm sure the father's heart is the same way. Anyway, um, here's some pictures of the altar of incense. And um, what it might have looked like. Here's uh, the the uh, censer uh, which they used to um, to burn incense in, and um, here's some of the the, the eleven um, spices that went in there. And then the veil, the veil, the veil. Uh, I'm I'm not going to get into the veil, but this is the veil that goes in the holy of holies. It's another picture of Yeshua, and it's coming into the throne room of Elohim. You see the the cherubim uh, there on the curtain uh, because he has these divine entities surrounding his uh his presence there in his throne room of heaven and the ark of the covenant uh was a picture of that too um or that is the the holy of holies and the ark of the covenant was in there in the ark of the covenant uh, contained um uh, everything in there pointed to yeshua both the living torah and also the written torah the um um the manna aaron's rod that budded and the ten commandments and the a Torah scroll was leaning up against it. That means that we can't we can't follow the Torah without Yeshua, without His life, without His help. Um, and we've talked about that. We're not going to go into that. It was it had the mercy seat on top. Um, I'm not going to get into that. And then over the top of that was the uh, oh, everything in the ark pointed to Yeshua. The mercy seat points to Elohim's throne in heaven, a throne of mercy and grace. Each year on the Day of Atonement, the high priest would enter the Holy of Holies and sprinkle blood on the altar and, and, and atone for himself and his family in Israel. So this was a picture of the Day of Atonement. I didn't mention the table of showbread is a picture of, of um, uh, um, Yom Teruah, the day of, um, the day of trumpets, uh, which the Jews call Rosh Hashanah. That's an erroneous name. It's not found in the Bible. And then the uh, 
altar of incense is a picture of Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement. And again, I, I've done teachings on that. We're not going to get into that. And then the, uh, here's the Ark of the Covenant. This is a picture of the Feast of Tabernacles. Um, and I've done teachings on that. This is, the, this is the marriage supper of the Lamb. This is where intimacy takes place. This is where the bride and the bridegroom come together in intimacy, in oneness. And it's under the glory cloud, which there you see the glory, the Shekinah. And this is, a, I believe, this is a picture of um, living in the presence of, living in a state of matrimony uh, with Yeshua forever and ever, the glorified saints living with him in glory forever and ever in the um, the Olam Haba, or the New Heavens, New Earth, New Jerusalem. That's the last, basically the last two chapters of the book of Revelation.